Сейчас у нас здесь в институте и будут еще две лекции в университете. Завтра 121 аудитория в переходе лабораторного корпуса в 4.20 и в четверг точно так же 121 аудитория в 4.20. Следующая лекция будет вторая лекция, но первая сегодня по дезактивации катализатора, вторая лекция будет по кинетическим моделям для сложных политических процессов. И третья лекция будет про процесс производства синтез газа и математической модели. Ну, в этой области, в общем, работа профессора Фрома на самом деле носит такой конечный характер. В общем, во многом эта область вообще была не сформирована. Ну, в общем, все. Я на этом замолкаю и доставляю слово нашему визуалу. Спасибо, спасибо. Я надеюсь, это все, что вы Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in the institute that I visited several times, but a long time ago. And I have the best memories uh, of my visits. And I should also add that the name of the Institute of Catalysis is known all over the world. And I hope and I'm sure that all young people who are here will contribute to even improve the name and the reputation of the Institute. Okay. Uh, let me uh, start. This talk is on catalyst deactivation. And the um, pointer. Okay, I got it. Well, this is an obvious uh, slide. Oh, 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 oh. You learn. Um, well, this is a rather obvious slide. And when we want to do kinetic modeling of a chemical reaction or process, we have to consider the catalyst with its composition and structure. We have to know the chemistry. And we have to detail the main reactions and the deactivation and the type of deactivation that I will deal with this afternoon is deactivation by coke formation, by coking. And uh, we also have to introduce, of course, in the kinetic modeling, we have to introduce the operating conditions. Yeah? Okay. Uh, can we leave off that left-hand side, uh, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, we need great equations. As I said, for the main reactions, and that is a function of partial pressure and temperature, but we also need a rate equation for the formation of coke. And coke is not something that falls out of the sky, it is formed by chemical reactions, side unwanted side reactions. But that rate of coking is just of the same type. And it is uh, as the main reaction rates, it is a function of partial pressures and temperature. OK. Now we have to introduce the mechanism of coke formation. And what? Because that is very important as we will see. And what I uh, show here 
there are various ways that in which the coking reaction can take place. One of it, one way is that the coke formation B goes to C, coke, is consecutive to the main reaction A goes to B. And another possibility is that the coke formation A goes to C is parallel to the main reaction A goes to B. It is important to know that because if you consider a tubular reactor, a reactor in which you have a gradient of the concentrations, then the coke will be deposited according to a profile. This is the distance in the reactor, or if we look at the pore, it would be the distance inside the pore. And if the coke is formed by a reaction which is consecutive to the main reaction, there is no B yet at the inlet of the reactor, so there won't be any coking in the inlet, but the coke formation will increase as I go through the reactor, there will be a profile of coke deposited in the reactor. On the other hand, if the coking occurs by a reaction which is parallel to the main reaction A goes to B, then the coking will be maximum in the, at the inlet of the reactor, because that is where I have the maximum A, and the coke will uh, decrease through the tubular reactor. So this is extremely important. Coke is not deposited uniformly in a gradient reactor. And, uh, okay, how are we going to account for the coke formation? Well, the coke deactivates the main reaction. The coke deactivates the main reaction. And we will express that deactivation through a deactivation function. The same for coking, because coking is, as I said, a chemical reaction, and it will suffer from the deposition of coke. The sites on which coke is being formed will be covered by coke, and they will de it, the coking will deactivate its own formation. So we have a deactivation function. We have a deactivation function for the coke formation. My my fingers are too thick, you know. <laughs> yeah, go back. So the coping rate is subject to deactivation also, and I have to multiply the initial rate of coke formation by a deactivation function, just uh, the same as what I do for the main reaction. So these deactivation functions are both in a different way dependent on the coke formation. For coke ah, uh, I do not want to get into the developments that I show here, but if you look at the series of papers that Jean Beekman and I published on that theme, Jean Beekman is in central research with Exxon, uh, by the way, uh, so we published a number of papers on the deactivation, and I'm just showing you what we covered. Everything is covered. You can express the deactivation of any reaction 
provided you have the experimental data. But what, do, what did we do? We looked at the micro level, which is the site level, and we looked at the phenomenon, which is coverage plus growth, because coke grows on coke. It's, it's a chemical reaction. It's kind of a polymerization reaction. So uh, we covered the coverage and growth for situations of uniform sites, of clusters of uniform sites, of sites of different nature. And then we looked at the meso level, which is in the first place pore level, or networks of pores. And there, too, we consider coverage and growth. And more than that, because the coke can grow to such a size that it blocks a pore and kills reactions behind the blockage. And uh, we also consider networks of pores. We accounted for diffusion limitations for the coke. Uh, in the particles, etc. And then, and then we apply all that to the macro level, uh, uh, which is the react product. So we did everything. And I refer to the literature for further information on that. What I will do in the next slides is the applications of the theory. Yep. And one, just one example, uh, meso level is the pore level. Just one example before we get to the applications. Uh, a slide out of Jean Bittmann's works. Uh, coping in pores, so I consider site coverage, both growth, and it can grow to such a size that the pore is being blocked. That is what you see here, the blue uh, dots and that uh, block before. And we suppose, and this is a simplified uh, situation, we suppose uh, infinite rate of coke growth, which means that the rate determining step is the coverage of a site. And, and as soon as the site is covered, and will look, the book grows and blocks the pore. And the rest is a question of probability calculations. Uh, the site coverage uh, leads to a deactivation function, phi, which, what is the deactivation? Well, it is because we have covered the active sites and uh, so the total concentration of sites is here. This is the concentration of sites covered by coke, and this is the total concentration. So it's the fraction of sites that are being covered uh, by coke or uncovered by coke. Possibilities of the Institute of Pedagogy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when uh, we have a site, when we have only site coverage, then this is the deactivation function. But if there is also blockage, then there is the deactivation becomes a multiplication, you have to multiply the amount of sites, the fraction covered, you have to multiply with the probability and that a site is uh, uh, covered. So, okay, we have here an exponential uh, dependency of the site coverage or the deactivation function where these, this is the rate of all the processes that produce coke, 
This is the rate yeah, of site coverage, and that rate is the rate of chemical reaction. It's a function of partial pressures and temperatures, and the rate expression contains rate coefficients and adsorption equilibrium uh, constants. Okay, the, if the rate of growth of coke is infinite, then the rate determining step of the process of coking is the rate of formation of coke. And that rate of formation is proportional with the rate of site coverage. These are proportionality coefficients. So the fraction of the sites that are covered is called omega, and that's the integral of the rate at which we uh, cover sites by group and multiply it with its deactivation function because coking is deactivating itself. Okay? And then out of that uh, we get the coke content. So that is just one example of the complicated cases that uh, we studied in that uh, work. This is a, a result where uh, we show the deactivation function as a function of the fraction of sites that are covered and the deactivation function that expresses at the activity. I could also have chosen uh, activity function. Uh, it's like the man who's sitting before a glass of beer, you know, and the glass of beer is half full or half empty. If he's an optimist, he will say, my glass is half full. If he's a pessimist, he will say, my glass is half empty. So this is the choice we have to make between activity or deactivation function. Uh, so this is the deactivation function. It tells you how the activity decreases with the coverage, and we look here by pore blockage, and we look at the diameter of the coke, and if the diameter of the coke is large, then the deactivation by pore blockage will be fast. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's get to the examples, and the examples that I will deal with are uh, steam reforming, I will leave out because I will talk on that subject uh, in another place. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, ethyl benzene dehydrogenation into styrene, which is an important industrial process in which uh, you have a lot of coke formation. We will talk about the riser catalytic cracking of gas. Uh, vacuum gas oil, that is commonly called FCC, with ice cap cracking, which is the example of deactivation by coke formation. We'll uh, say a few words about ethanol to olefins, and we'll say a few words about salt acid alkylation. Instead of using the horrible HF alkylation, uh, people are searching quite a bit, uh, have been searching for many years on solid acid alkylation and you need a solid with extreme acidity for that. And we, but it deactivates very rapidly. We'll deal with that also. Let's start with the uh, uh, ethyl benzene into uh, styrene dehydrogenation. Um, this is the reaction scheme for the so-called main reactions. We have ethyl benzene, and that yields styrene and hydrogen. It's a reversible reaction. And we also form benzene and ethylene, and toluene and methylene by irreversible reactions. 
But styrene and hydrogen also give toluene, of course. It's a rather complex uh, reaction scheme. And if we want to design a reactor, we need kinetic equations for that. I'm showing you kinetic equations for the various reactions we have here. We don't need to enter into the details. The only point I want to make is those are rate equations of the so-called Haugen and Watson type. What does that mean? Uh, you still see in the literature, and I don't understand, uh, rate equations which only have the numerator here and do not explicitly account for the adsorption at equilibrium for the equilibrium adsorption of the species. That was the contribution of Howell and Watson in the 1940s and uh, uh, I think that should be systematically uh, applied. Careful, uh, these assume here in the denominator, these terms assume that the adsorption has reached equilibrium. In other words, that the adsorption is much faster than the chemical reaction, which is generally the case with a well-developed catalyst. So we have rate equations for the main reactions, but, but as I said, if we want to make a decent design of the reactor, we also need rate equations for the coping. And yeah. uh, what I'm showing here is the deactor is a rate of coke formation, and the coke formation is considered to consist of two parts. One, there is the site coverage by the coke precursor with concentration CP. And then coke grows on coke because uh, it's kind of a polymerization process because the coping ingredients are uh, uh, have double bonds, uh, are unsaturated, and so you have polymerization of the coke. So you need two rate equations, one rate equation for the formation of the precursor, this is the concentration of the coke precursor that covers the site, and then you need a rate equation expressing the growth of the coke starting from that precursor. That is what I've done here and here. This is precursor, this is growth of the coke. But, 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 in a process like uh, ethyl benzene dehydrogenation, you also have steam. And the steam is added uh, to gasify as much as possible the coke that has been deposited. What I write here is a gasification rate equation. Huh? Gasification is just a, rate, uh, just a rate process like any other. And so this is coke precursor evolution with time as a consequence of formation of the coke precursor and of its gasification. And that steady state, that would be zero. But it doesn't stop there. As I said, the coke grows on the coke. So I need a rate equation that also expresses how fast the coke grows. OK. So let's look at the next uh, slide. What I'm showing here again is just the rate equations of coke precursor formation and of the growth of coke and the rate of gasification of the coke so that the net rate of coke formation is the difference between the formation of coke and the gasification which has a rate equation also. Well, if you put that into the continuity equations, the conservation equations, 
for ethyl benzene, for styrene, and for coke, uh, you can calculate the profile of ethyl benzene, of styrene, and of coke. Coke is deposited according to a profile, that's clear, as a function of the uh, conversion to styrene and hydrogen. And the main reaction is ethyl benzene goes to styrene and hydrogen. So all I plot here is the uh, dynamic equilibrium coke formation versus the conversion of styrene uh, of ethyl benzene into styrene. Let me first show it here with the slide. This is time. This is the run length. And this is the coke content of the catalyst. And I'm looking at a given position in the reactor. Given position Z. And I'm looking at the run length. And the coke formation goes like this. Coke content of the catalyst evolves with time, with a run length, like this, and it reaches a quasi-steady state. But in the begin it's only in the beginning that you have this fast increase, and here you have this quasi-steady state because coke deactivates its own formation. Now, uh, this is the slide that this shows the equilibrium content uh, of the coke as a function of the conversion of ethyl benzene, and it goes like that at various temperatures, three temperatures. Uh, coke is deposited according to a profile in the reactor. That should be clear by now. Uh, but what is interesting is you talk to a styrene producer, you talk about deactivation, and he says, my catalyst does not deactivate. Oh no, doesn't it deactivate? You really believe that? Let me show you what happens. Uh, this is what you have in your reactor. Initially, you have a lot of coke formation. But after a while, after a certain run length, the coke deactivates its own formation, and you get to a steady, kind of a steady, steady state, a dynamic equilibrium coke content. And the, the initial coking is extremely fast. And before you really have your GCs set up and equilibrated to take online sampling of the ethyl benzene and the styrene, etc., you don't see any change anymore. The coking is very, very rapid. But does that mean if you if you measure here with your GC and you see, oh, it's constant, I have a deactivation, forget it. You have deactivated it very much, but you have reached a steady, steady state in the deactivation, and you think eh, it doesn't deactivate, but you're not operating the catalyst at its optimal condition because it's deactivated. All right, next one. Yeah, those are typical pro profiles in a three-bed uh, styrene reactor. And the styrene reactor uh, really consists of generally three beds uh, because the reaction is very endothermic. And what you do between the two or three beds is you reheat the reaction mixture, uh, so the temperature go goes down, case number one here for instance, temperature goes down in the first bed, and the reaction will die because of the temperature being too low. So what you do is you reheat in between, going to the second bed, uh, you, uh, the conversion uh, decreases, uh, well, increases and the activity decreases, and then you enter a third bed, and after 
reheating again so that you use the beds in an optimal way. Okay, uh, this is the most well-known example of the effect of catalyst deactivation. Uh, you know, before 1940, uh, the cap cracking of vacuum gas oil to produce uh, more, uh, uh, better lighter fractions, uh, gasoline, diesel, kale, that was done by cap, that is done by cap cracking. And before 1940, that was done in a fixed bed, that was the Houdri process for cap cracking, but it deactivated like crazy. And they had to uh, switch uh, very, very frequently and to regeneration, etc. Then, in, during the World War, uh, the uh, U.S. government encouraged companies like Exxon and engineering companies like Kellogg to cooperate and design something that would be more efficient uh, for cat cracking than the Houdri fixed bed system. Yeah, 1942, they developed, Kellogg and Exxon, uh, developed the fluidized bed technology, uh, whereby uh, well, you have, in one bed, you have the reactions, and then the catalyst uh, deactivates by both formation. You circulate that into the regenerator, you inject air, you burn off the coke, recycle the catalyst to the reactor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> later, that was until the 60s or 70s, I think, later, uh, Mobile in Paulsboro developed the uh, zeolite catalysts. And those zeolite catalysts were so active that they couldn't use a classic uh, fluidized bed anymore because they overcracked the products. They ended up with, uh, with, with gases, no gasoline, and no kale, etc. So that is when they introduced, and this is what I've shown here, uh, the riser cracking. So the catalyst enters at the bottom of the riser and the, the that is where the cracking takes place. You inject uh, the vacuum gas oil at the bottom of the riser. And here you have a separator where you separate the catalyst from the gases, the vapors, which go after a cyclone, of course, to uh, recover and train the catalyst which go to the separation units, etc., distillation, etc. But the catalyst goes down here, and in the regenerator, you blow air and burn off the, the coke from the catalyst and recycle the catalyst to the bottom of the riser cap cracking part. So that is the modern uh, FCC unit. And uh, we're going to model that. Yeah. And now, now, now we need some chemistry. Uh, we need chemistry to explain the main reactions, of course. And we also need chemistry to explain what happens in the coating uh, in the FCC reactor. Uh, in one of my other talks here, I will come back to, I don't believe that I'm going to enter into the details of this talk, into the single event uh, kinetic approach, which uh, is a very fundamental approach and that permits you to determine rate coefficients 
that are basic, that are fundamental, and that are no mixture of all sorts of contributions. But, but that implies that you express the reaction, the conversion, that you express the reactions in terms of what is called elementary steps. And only when you do that, when you base your kinetic formulation on elementary steps, only then you will derive from the experimental data rate coefficients which are unique for the various types of elementary steps that occur. Okay, what are the elementary steps that occur in FCC, in cat cracking of vacuum gas or well, I'm not going to enter in all that chemistry, uh, but there are 14 types of elementary steps, one of which is, for instance, beta scission. These are carbonium ions. Uh, and you start from paraffins or whatever, the reaction in, in, in the reactor conditions, they are converted into olefins and the olefins are protonated to yield carbonium ions. That's why you have this plus sign on the various uh, uh, species here. And one of them, one of those elementary steps, for instance, is beta scission. That is, there will be a scission of a carbon, carbon link in beta position with respect to the positive uh, position, to the position of carbonium ion here. And this beta scission, uh, which is one of the steps occurring in cat cracking, yields this, uh, uh, we start from one, two, three, four, five, yeah, from the C6, well, we have two C3, C3 carbonium ions, and another finite. Product. So you have 14 types of elementary steps that occur in uh, camp cracking. Uh, now you would say, oh, 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 this is nice. We only have 14 rate coefficients. Yes, forget it. Because you have thousands, you have hundreds of thousands of components in there in the vacuum gas oil some in C25, and some in C40, and, and with different structures, etc. You feel already and that if you want to do it like this, which is the only correct way of doing it, and it will be kind of an effort, it will require kind of an effort to describe everything, to generate the reaction network in terms of the elementary steps that I mentioned here. But it is feasible. Eh? You can generate the reaction network eh? just as you generate by hand. A goes to B, B goes to C, A goes to D. Eh? You can do that, yeah. Here, of course, you need a computer. And it is a big job. But you need to do it only once. Once you have generated the reaction network for cat cracking, is finished. You don't have to repeat it anymore. You can then apply it to any operating conditions for the FCC and for any catalyst that you have developed. Yes. Uh, yeah, those were 14 types of elementary steps for the main reactions. There are elementary steps that also enter into the coke formation, and those are mainly aromatic uh, carbonium ions. I'm not going to go through all those uh, here. Here are just a few examples. And again, uh, that means that there's a large number of elementary steps. The computer will do it for you. It'll take a few days of computing. When we developed that 20 years ago, oh yeah, uh, it took weeks of computation 
Now you go to the supercomputer and he will do that in a couple of days. Okay? Yeah. But, 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 how will I impose the computer to generate that network? Huh? As I said, if it's A goes to B and B goes to C, you can do it by hand. I told you, no, you need a computer. But to have the computer do that for you, you have to express the chemistry in terms of Boolean matrices, huh? a Boolean algebra. And indeed, and we developed that in 1985, I believe, uh, you can express any molecule or carbonium ion, you can express uh, that in a binary ma matrix, in a Boolean relation matrix, that tells you how uh, the ad carbon atom 2 is connected with 1, I have put the 1 there, and you have carbon ion, uh, carbon atom 2 is connected with carbon atom 3. Uh, well, you put a 1 here underneath 3, and it is connected with 7, and you put a 1 there under 7. And when you add up, uh, you find out here 2, I have 3 1s there. Well, that tells me already the property of carbon atom 2, it is a tertiary carbonium ion. And we well, have three ones, three. So you can describe the properties of the molecule or the ion in terms of Boolean relation matrices. And you can describe, of course, any transformation, for instance, a metal shift uh, of seven carbon uh, atom seven from here to there, well, we can describe that just by shifting the ones and the zeros in your Boolean relation matrix. Okay, so that's the basics of it. A little bit more to it, but anyway, it's feasible. We've done it, uh, and for the first time, and we described the whole uh, FCC and other uh, processes in terms of Boolean relation matrices. Yeah. All right, all right. Now, here's the word again. Uh, if you have a tremendous number of reactions of elementary steps, yeah? Meaning you have a tremendous number of rate coefficients. There's no way that you can determine hundreds of rate parameters out of your experimental data. Uh, regardless of the amount of experimental data that you have produced. But, when you think of it, what do I have as components in such a vacuum gas oil? I have paraffinic molecules, I have aromatic, I have naphthenic molecules, I have naphthenoaromatics, and they all go from C4 up to C40. Meaning, when I look at the paraffins, normal paraffins for instance, I go from C3, C4, C5, C6, up to C40. Yeah? And that means that I have long chains of carbons with hydrogen. You have what is called homologous series of paraffins, of naphthenes, of aromatics, of naphthenoaromatics. I mean, paraffins go from C3 up to C40. That's a homologous series. And that is why you have so many components in, uh, in uh, vacuum gas or uh, hundred thousands in particular when they are transformed. You have at least 40,000 uh, in the vacuum gas oil itself, and then upon transformation you have 100,000 of components. And how can we deal with such a homologous series kinetically, intuitively? 
uh, it is clear if you think one second about it, there must be some relation between the decay of the paraffin with C25 carbons and with C14 carbons, paraffins. There must be some relation uh, for, uh, on the rate coefficients of these components. That is what we have used in the single event concept. And uh, let me show you the next slide. Um, yes. Well, uh, when I look at the rate coefficient, I have an entropy contribution which in Arrhenius expression is represented by A, that is the entropy contribution, but there's a lot hidden behind A, and there is an energy contribution, which in the Arrhenius expression is represented by E. Okay. Let me first look at the entropy contribution, the frequency factor in Arrhenius terms. Well, uh, the entropy change of a molecule or an ion upon reaction, this entropy change consists of vibrational contributions uh, rotational contributions, electronic contributions. When I look at it, is there something in these contributions which could, which is related directly to the change in entropy, which is the most important in the change in entropy? Well, intuitively, uh, it is a rotational contribution. We got to it intuitively. Afterwards, we went into statistical mechanics, and there you find uh, the various contribution to the entropy change uh, associated with an elementary step. And indeed, indeed, the rotational contribution uh, is the one that is most significant, and is the uh, structure is most pronounced in the rotational contribution. Okay, so we pick out the rotational contribution and that consists of, this is the entropy associated with the rotational property. And that contains an intrinsic contribution and a symmetry contribution. Okay, when I look at this, at the rotational contribution, when I look at that, when a reactant, uh, an ion, uh, reacts into the intermediate uh, state, then there is a change in entropy and the delta and the change in entropy and that is linked to the symmetry and that change in symmetry as I go from the carbonium ion to the activated state is here and it contains the symmetry of the reactor and the symmetry of the activated state and what we do, what we do this is the expression of the rate coefficient, and this is the entropy part of it, and this is the energy part of it, the activation energy. Well, when I go from an ion to uh, an active uh, state, transition state, then this is the change in symmetry contribution. What I do is I factor that out of the rate coefficient. And I call what I factored out, this ratio of symmetry numbers, I call that the number of single events. What is left in the entropy 
is the so-called single event frequency factor and that is independent of the structure. I factored out the effect of the structure in the number of single events. So what is left is a frequency factor that I call the single event frequency factor and which does not contain the ratio of the symmetry numbers. And that means it doesn't contain the effect of the structure anymore. And that means that uh, this will be independent of the chain length. So that one will have a single value going from C4 up to C40. And this is what I call the number of single events. And you get that out of any uh, uh, st uh, statistical uh, design factor, uh, as you find Gaussian, for instance, uh, that you find in the literature. So the rate coefficient is now the number of single events, single event frequency factor, which is independent of the length of the whole of the series. And what remains is the energy contribution. Well, the energy contribution people had solved for us before. Yeah. And uh, that was done by uh, Evans and Polanyi. That's also part of uh, statistical mechanics and chemistry. And it says that the activation energy of a elementary step is a function of the heat of reaction. That's kind of normal. Huh? It's a function of the heat of reaction. And there are two independent parameters in that relation. Huh? And you can find that in any book on uh, uh, fundamental chemistry. OK, so now we have the tools to determine kinetics, rate coefficients that are independent of the chain length. And after we have determined that from the experimental data, and we can calculate the effect of the chain length based starting from those two basic things. Yeah? Okay, uh, this is a network that leads to the coke formation in cat cracking, I'm not entering into the details. But what you see here is a lot of aromatic uh, compounds that are transformed into the ultimate step, uh, ultimate product coke. coke. the various steps, final steps uh, leading to go. Okay, let me show you the result. I hope. Yeah. Well, you need to introduce the activation functions uh, into the rate of conversion of the component I or rate of formation of the component. Uh, so we have the initial initial rate. And then you have to multiply with the deactivation function, which is a function of the coke content. And we have seen now how we can get uh, the rate coefficients of the main elementary steps and of the coking elementary steps. There is a problem, of, uh, however, when uh, you deal with something as complex as vacuum gas oil. The question is, uh, Am I going to determine the activation functions for the 14 types of elementary steps? Difficult. So what we did, we compromised, and we said, well, we will consider three deactivation functions. We will group some steps 
uh, and we group them into three uh, expressions. Deactivation function for hydride transfer, for protonation, for photolytic scission. That was, this was one deactivating group. Then there was metal shift and PCP branching, etc. Those we lumped into a second deactivation function. And then we kept one separate, that is for alkylation, which is the main final step in FCC that leads to coke. And we could determine from the experimental data the deactivation functions as a function of the riser length as a function of the conversion, if you like. And yeah. uh, we did pretty well with this. And for instance, what I'm showing here is the riser length, 50 meters high, and here the various yields of the commercial fractions. Uh, and you can see here the gasoline the light cycle oil that decreases with the rise of length, uh, LPG, and here, book formation of the order of 4 or 5 percent, which is exactly what was observed with that uh, Lago Media Venezuelan crew uh, in the commercial uh, riser. So this is for the commercial fractions, but we can detail that much more. And we can tell you oh, the C30 uh, uh, beta scission uh, will deactivate uh, like this uh, as a function of both content. You can describe the deactivation for any of the components that you have considered in the global reaction network. But what I'm showing here is when you talk to the refinery, they say, uh, I will say, oh, beta decision of C25 deactivates like this, they are, I couldn't care less. Tell me how the gasoline is going to deactivate. Tell me how the uh, light cycle oil is going to perform as a function of time, etc. That is why I brought I lumped all the information again together into commercial fractions so that you can talk the same language as the refiner, and this is important. Yeah, let me say a few words about the MTO. I don't know. Uh, I will show them. If you do MTO on sample 34, which is the best that produces the best yields better than GSM-5 in MTO. And first you start from M, that mole. You, uh, uh, you uh, dehydrate it into dimethyl ether, and then you go through a uh, three-stage uh, reactor, four-stage reactor, and then you separate the products into the commercial fraction. Yeah. Uh, this, the chemistry for this has been studied quite a bit by people at Cambridge and other places in England. So what I have done here, we have accepted the chemistry that people develop there. And what you have is you protonate the methanol Automated methanol dehydrates, you produce this so called methoxy ion, CH3 plus, for me is good enough. Uh, then that reacts with another molecule of methanol, and that is protonated dimethyl ether. Yeah? And that can give dimethyl ether, but, but, but. We want uh, to go to the MTO cycle, yeah. And this is what happens. And so you have the uh, CH3 plus that reacts with methanol to yield ethylene, or it can react 
with uh, the C3 here to generate propylene. So you have ethylene and propylene in parallel. Yeah. That's essentially the same, except that it doesn't stop with the production of ethylene and propylene, but these orphans react further to produce C4, C5, C6 uh, orphans, which are side products, but anyway, you have to live with that. Yeah. And what I'm showing you here is that weird, as I told you, chemistry and that uh, I showed in the previous slide. Out of that, that we want to remember, out of that you produce ethyl and propyl uh, carbenium ions, and out of those you, pro you produce ethylene and propylene. But, but it doesn't stop there. Those oligomerize into C7, C8, C9, uh, which are too heavy for the catalyst, sample 34, and deactivate the sample 34. But careful what I show here. Again, these, this so-called cope in that case, that so-called cope is not a dead body. And the ions that you produce here, they interact with the cope. And they uh, interact with the coke and can produce ethyl and propyl radicals. The coke is not a dead body. The coke is not an inert both body. That was the same in FCC, by the way. And that is well known that uh, the people from the refineries know and that the coke is not a dead body, but I cannot quantitatively explain what it does. Here you have the same, and the deactivating agents, C8, C9, etc., they can be, uh, they can react with uh, the methyl uh, ions and, and react into ethylene and propylene, etc. some data that we determined many years ago and uh, that I uh, utilized using the scheme that I just showed and using kinetics that we determined uh, 20 years after we determined those data. Let us look at the blue curves only. That is 100% ethanol. The red ones are methanol diluted with water. Let's look at the group curves only. This is as a function of what you have fed, the amount that you have fed, in other words, the amount as a function of time. Uh, this is what happens. This is the conversion uh, of methanol. And suddenly it deactivates. Uh, this is the yield, this blue curve here, is the yield of dimethyl ether intermediate. And this blue curve is the yield of C2 and C4, what you would really want. But as you notice here, after a certain amount of methanol fed, uh, you have a deactivation. And the deactivation is visible as soon as there is a breakthrough of the intermediate dimethyl ether. Well, I've seen all kinds of explanations of this in terms of the oh, uh, behavior of the catalyst, etc., etc. Well, very simple. It's a matter of deactivation. It's a matter of deactivation by the own product. And what I show here is the propylene yield. We also have chosen the ethylene yield. This is the propylene yield as a function of essentially time, something that is proportional to space time, which is proportional with clock time. 
And what you see here are curves at zero time, just after starting with a fresh catalyst. What happens is propylene yield uh, is very, the yield, the propylene is formed in a very rapid way. And suppose for a second that it doesn't react any further. And it goes through the reactor. Here at the exit, you see oh, very high yield of propylene. As uh, the catalyst deactivates, you see this. It takes more space in the reactor to convert uh, into propylene and to convert the methanol into propylene. The deactivation continues, but no problem. I have so much catalyst in that bed that I still don't see any decrease in propylene yield at the exit. But it shifts all the time and it takes more and more depth in the reactor to achieve the conversion that I wanted. And until I am here that the deactivation has reached such a level that you don't have all the propylene anymore at the exit that you expected. And that is it. Then I will say, hey, my catalyst is deactivating. But it only deactivates after such a time here. Oh, forget it. It has deactivated right from the beginning. But you have so much catalyst in that reactor that you do not notice it. And that is what I have shown here. This is, uh, again, the amount fell. <coughs> this is time, and this is the propylene yield. And first, you don't see any deactivation, a constant propylene yield. And then, after the time, it deactivates. And you say, and you try to find interpretations, why the catalyst starts deactivating here. Makes no sense. The catalyst deactivates from the very beginning. But you have so much catalyst in there that you don't notice. I have another example like this in which you would think, oh, I don't have deactivation, and suddenly it deactivates. Wait a minute. This is solid acid alkylation that I mentioned. You know, uh, nowadays they make C8 gasoline out of the mixture of C4, butene, and butane. And they do that with HF, and it's a terrible operation. And everybody is searching for solid acids catalyst that will do the job. So, okay, you, this is a catalyst which is not acid enough for that. Um, but I inherited that problem from the else. I had to make out of it what I could. So why is you right? Certain temperature, pressure, etc. And then these are the products that you see. And you have Monomethyl, you have dimethyl, you have trimethyl, uh, uh, C6 and C5, etc. And that is the mixture that you get uh, when you feed this and that at these conditions in fixed bed. And you have, when you look at the reaction at work, and you have isomerizations oligomerizations, cracking by beta scission, uh, hydride transfer, those are the elementary steps that you have to use to express the reaction that forms that product. Yeah? Yeah? Well, I'm showing uh, the chemistry here again. So you start from uh, the two and from butane and isobutane. Out of that, you get monomethyl O8, uh, dimethyl and trimethyl components and with a total of eight uh, carbon atoms. Yeah? But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. You have all sorts of reactions that I will not specify, but that need two components. Uh, here, out of these, you produce components in the range C8, 
C9, and those are too heavy for the, that catalyst to dissolve, so they stick permanently to the reactor and they de to the re to the catalyst, and they deactivate uh, C9 plus. They deactivate the catalyst permanently. This is the coke, huh? but we know the composition of the coke. Yeah? But this would be coke. Yeah? And uh, well, we have determined using the single event approach, uh, because there are hundreds and hundreds of reactions there. By means of the single event approach, we have determined the kinetics uh, for the various steps, automated cyclopropane mechanism, oligomerization, hybrid transfer, etc. We have determined 11 rate parameters that were necessary to describe the transformation. We have the numbers of that. And when we have the numbers, we can simulate uh, a reactor operation. Yeah? And to account for the deactivation, you have to consider the sites that you have. So those are uncovered and still active uh, catalyst, catalytic sites. Those are sites that are covered, covered by reaction products, but these reaction products, as I told you, are not inert. Uh, coke grows on coke, uh, and therefore uh, this still has uh, the possibility of doing the alkylation, be it at a smaller rate than the original size. But then there are the ones that are covered with C8, C9, and higher, and that are deactivated. Okay. We can write the continuity equations for that, and without getting into the details, you have 44 continuity equations uh, that uh, describe the 31 alkanes and the 13 groups of olefins that you form. And you have uh, 541 continuity equations for the uh, irreversibly adsorbed ions, eh, which are permanently deactivated. That's a big system of uh, differential equations that you have to solve without going into the detail. We can do that nowadays. Yeah. And the results are, I think we're close to the last slide, here's the results. Uh, this is uh, proportional to the distance in the reactor, the length in the reactor, this axis. And here are rates which are shown in order. And what the rates that I want to show is the rates of the olefin feed and the rates of the products and I also want to show the deactivation. Well, what happens is that, as I have shown before, you don't see anything for a long time and you get the products out of the reactor, which is the length here, and you get the products out of the reactor that you expect. And you're particularly happy, this catalyst does not deactivate. Wait a minute, and as we have seen with the propylene, after a certain while, and there is breakthrough of the intermediates indicating you have deactivation, and that is what we see here. So we look at it at a certain block time, and the reaction is, taking, is extremely fast and is taking place in a very narrow zone because it is so fast. We've seen it with the propylene curve. And so everything takes place here, and here where you have the products. But this is where the deactivation from has arrived after time t. 
uh, a little bit later, everything will be still concentrated in a very narrow zone of the reactor, a little bit further in the reactor. And it moves like that through the reactor, and so the reaction takes place in the narrow zone, but with the deactivation, the narrow zone shifts and shifts, and you don't see any deactivation until that zone here comes close to the exit. But the deactivation has been there from time zero onwards, but you don't realize it, and you think, oh, I'm not a good catalyst that doesn't deactivate. Okay, I think that is the last slide. Well, that's repeating what I just said. And that is also repeating what I just said, in other words. This is the conclusion. <laughs> I think, uh, I hope I have shown you that uh, deactivation is something that has to be considered. Yeah, one. Two, that it can be formulated. It is the consequence of reactions just like the main reactions that you can formulate that and that having formulated that, that we can describe the process subject to deactivation and tell uh, the people who are in charge of regeneration, hey, this is what happens, next week we'll have to stop and uh, regenerate the process, and tell the people who designed the catalyst, no, catalyst is not performed the way that you promised. Huh? Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. and of oxygenates, you can 
reduce the number of intrinsic parameters through the single event approach. And we had for the whole Fisher, Fisher Coach process something on the order of 14 parameters, if I remember correctly. It is the first time that it has been done in this way. Because if you look at the literature, the kinetics, so-called kinetics, that they have published on Fisher Coach is just the conversion, the kinetics of the conversion of hydrogen and of the conversion of CO and not kinetics for the formation uh, of the homologous, homo homologous series of paraffins, uh, olefins and alcohols, which they tried to relate to the conversion of hydrogen and CO by means of uh, uh, experimental plots. So, but if you look at that paper, American Institute of Chemical Engineers Journal, February this year. Uh, Ping Tsao, I, and a couple of other people. Uh, we did the, the kinetics very strictly of Fisher Coach for any component C35, C36, be it the paraffin, an olefin, or an oxygen. Did I answer your question? Okay. Thank you. More questions? Sure, Professor. Uh, do you use any absorption coefficients in a single event approach? Do you use uh, any absorption coefficients in single event approach? I don't understand. So, the, do you use uh, some absorption inhibition terms, uh, absorption coefficients in single events uh, approach? Inhibition well, terms. Well, uh, if, you, if you use the single event approach, uh, what? I've had, I have considered situations in which the absorption is fast compared with the reaction rate. And therefore, uh, you assume, like Haldeman and Watson did, uh, you assume that the absorption is at equilibrium. So you concentrate on the reactions proper. Hmm? Since you assume that the the uh, adsorption is at equilibrium. And I, I may be wrong, correct me, but commercial processes, commercial processes all have uh, the uh, adsorption at equilibrium. Because if that would not be the case, if the adsorption would be of the same rate as the reaction, you wouldn't make optimal use of the catalyst. Sure, Professor. What kind of simulation tools are you using for your model? Uh, are there uh, your your own programs or some? Commercial uh, version of program. What kind of simulation tools yes, are you using in modern? You have a good voice, but we should come here. <laughs> so, what kind of software do we use for your simulations? What kind, what kind of, of uh, programs? Have you programs? Software. Uh, is it your own programs or this is some commercial software? Well, you can go quite a way with uh, software. For density functional theory, uh, Gaussian is pretty good, I think, and maybe better. Uh, we have used Gaussian for the DFT calculations. For the reactor calculations, there's quite a bit of software. The best one being Promax, 
will choose my programs uh, as a group. Uh, uh, you can, you can uh, use Aspen, but Aspen is not good for reactors. Aspen is pretty good for physical properties, but not for the reactors. The Promax, which is uh, an engineering company operating near Houston, near the university, they use all my programs. So, okay. But for, uh, for properties, um, for density functional theory, we have used Gaussian, that may be better, I don't know. Sure, Ну хорошо, давайте дадим нашу область еще раз. Я приглашаю на лекции завтра, послезавтра в университете. Еще раз, это 121 аудитория в переходе 4.20. Спасибо.